Okay, so if we're focusing on these planning agents that are using a transition graph. So this is the kind of world model that such an agent might have. Now this is an example that's taken from the textbook and it's based in Romania, right? So the idea is that you're on holiday in Romania, you're currently in Arad, and you have to get to Bucharest the following day because you have a non-refundable ticket back home and you have to plan how to get to Bucharest, right? So we're going to be looking at this example repeatedly with different search algorithms. So you've got a start state and you've got one or more goal states and you have to figure out a path from one to the other. And so we have to sort of formulate this task and, and discretize it, right? So we have to formulate, the, so the goal is to be in Bucharest on time. The states in this case are the various cities in the map. The actions that we can take or the, is the transitions between the states. So any time there's a connection between two cities, we can travel from one to the other. And the solution we're looking for is a sequence of actions or just a sequence of cities to get us from one place to the other. So we might go, for example, from Arad to Sibiu, to Fagaras, and then to Bucharest. And then we execute that plan by driving through the cities to get to our goal. So we can formulate this with states and actions. So our initial state, we're in Arad. The state space consists of the other cities. And then these actions take us from one city to the other. And the path cost is the sum of the distances or the number of actions or whatever we specify. Now, often we have to abstract away details from the real world. So when we say drive from Arad to Zerind, we treat that as an atomic action, but in fact you have to get in the car and follow the road signs and drive along the road and maybe stop for petrol along the way. And, and where in Zerind are you trying to get to? Are you trying to get to the town hall? Are you trying to get to the interstate uh, intersection or whatever? So how do you know when you've actually arrived in Zerind? So in order for this path to be realized, when we say Arad to Zerind, what we mean is no matter where we are in Arad, we will be able to get to some place in Zerind. And if we, if, if we can say that for each step in the path, then we'll, we'll be able to successfully make our way to the goal. So, but there's always these details that we abstract away. And some of these problems don't have a single agreed description. Okay, now these two-dimensional examples and these mazes and so on are in a way not, well, because they're on a two-dimensional grid, they don't really show the complexity that can happen in the full kind of path search. So if we look at puzzles like this, we actually can get into a higher dimensional space. So this is uh, an example of what's called sliding tile puzzles, I think, most of you probably have had experience with these. These are meant to be tiles that you can slide around and there's a blank space. So if I start from this position, I could move, what are the possible tiles I could move if I'm in this position? Two, five, six, or three. Because I can t I can, any tile that's next to the blank, I can slide towards the blank. So this again gets to this issue of representation. The simplest representation is to, is to think about the blank, you know, if you think about where the blank moves, does the blank move up, does it move down, does it move left or right? So there's at most four possible actions from each state. And so how do we abstract this away? So the states we regard as the integer locations of the tile. So if we physically move the tile, of course, it's actually sliding, in, it's sliding between all those intermediate states. But we abstract that away. And sometimes it gets jammed and we have to kind of bash it and unjam it. So these are the operators, up, down, left, or right. The goal state in this case is given. There's a unique goal state. And the path cost, we usually, normally, one tile moving one square is considered one move. And then... So the, if we're looking for an optimal solution, we say, well, what's the smallest number of moves to get from that start state to the goal state? 
Now in some formulations of the problem, if the blank moves multiple times in succession in the same direction, sometimes that's treated as one move. So if, if we started in this state, let's say the 8 moved here and then afterwards the 7 moved here, some people like to regard that as one move because you could put your thumb in there and push these two pieces together and that's treated as one move. So we have to be careful about the cost. So if, if you regard that as one move instead of two moves, that changes our perception of what the shortest path is. You know, that, that'll change our decisions about which moves to make. And this is a three-dimensional puzzle, Rubik's Cube. I think, <laughs> has anyone here never, never seen a Rubik's Cube? <laughs> no? <laughs> okay. Uh, so you're all very familiar with this. Yeah, so it's the same sort of issue as the eight puzzle, but in three dimensions. So this, the states are the integer locations of the small cubes. So we ignore intermediate positions like this one. The goal test, there's a, there's a unique uh, goal state that we're aiming towards, at least for this 3x3 three three cube. Now what about the operators? So in the 8 puzzle, we've got four different moves we could make in each position. Now in Rubik's Cube, how many moves are there that you can make from each position? <laughs> 12? 12 is a good answer. So each, there's six sides and each side can be turned either clockwise or anti-clockwise. So that's 12, yeah? I mean, that's, that's a good answer, but does anyone want to give a different answer? Six. Yeah, 20, 24. Yeah. Why 24? <laughs> because for each side, yes. you, can, you can either slide this one up or slide it down. Yes. And you can do that four times for each side. Right. But like, I think for six of them, three of them are identical to each other. Mm. So uh, we're talking about the three, we're not talking about the two by two cube, but the three by three cube. So it's different if you rotate this side and the, or this side is different. Yeah. Uh, 15. 18. 18. Good. Why do you say 18? Yeah, because there are like three. Middle one. I didn't think about that. So. Yeah. Right. Right. So it's three for each of the sides. Yeah. Okay, that is interesting. So I was going to say that 18, I was going to say 18 because you can do a half to, so for each, I wish I, I wish I had my, um, I thought I brought it with me, but I don't seem to have it. Oh, I do have it. Okay, it's very small, sorry. For each side you can do, you, I can turn the side clockwise or anti-clockwise. Now what happens if I turn it 180 degrees, we have a choice. We could either, it's like the eight, it's like the eight puzzle. We could treat 180 degrees as one move or we could treat it as two moves, right? And then, but again, it's, that, that'll change your perception of how many moves you are away from the goal. But your one is actually interesting. You're saying you can, <laughs> you, I think you said you can keep these two fixed. Oh, okay. I thought you were saying you would keep these two fixed and twist the middle, which is sort of true in a way. <laughs> yeah. Right, that's what you propose. Yeah, so that's another way of looking at it. What if I twist the middle? It's the same as twisting the two outside ones, but if I treated that as one move, then that would change my path length. Yeah. Kind of looks a bit like an X-wing fighter if you do that. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Dum 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 da dum dum dum. Um yeah, so you can see how the representation matters. Okay, and then we can look at a um, continuous thing like robot assembly. So here, the states are the real valued coordinates of the robot joint angles. The operations in this case are continuous motion of the robot joints. The goal test is complete assembly of whatever this object is and the time, the path cost would be the time to execute. So this just shows you how you can apply this to a different kind of task. Okay. All right, so 
there's various of these, and then we'll look at may or we'll have a look at these mazes uh, later on as well. That's another example. So we're going to look at various search algorithms here. And I, I know some of you may have looked at some of these things before um, in 1927, but we'll, I'll try to make it interesting for you along the way. So all of these algorithms that we're going to look at basically are some kind of tree search. Right, so that's our map of Romania. So you start by saying oh, I'm at Arad, so what are the places I can get to from Arad? I can get to Zarin, Timisoara or Sibiu and then you pick one of these and look at where you can get from that and so on and so on. So it ends up being a tree search, so I start with Arad and then from Arad I can get to these three places and I'm still not at the goal yet so I pick one of these and expand it. You know, there's my tree and there, you know, so I always pick nodes to expand and when I expand a node I cross it off and I generate its children and then I pick another node and I cross it off and, it, and generate its children and I generate a tree like this and so all of these albums follow this pattern but they differ in terms of how they choose which node to expand next. So I've always got a certain number of nodes that have already been expanded, that are crossed off I've got nodes that I haven't even reached yet and then I've got nodes that have been generated but haven't yet been expanded so they're leaves in the tree. So the leaves in the tree are either things that have been generated and not expanded or they might be things that I tried to expand but they didn't generate anything new. And so these nodes here which are generated but haven't yet been expanded, they're sitting in a priority queue and then I have to explore different ways of deciding which one to expand next. Okay, so if we're going to implement this search tree, it has a root and then each node can have children and a parent and you may want to store some information with the node. So this is the kind of data structure that you might have if you were going to implement this in some programming language, right? So for each node in the tree you might want to store the state that it corresponds to, a link to the parent node, you might want to remember the operator, or the most recent action that was taken to get to that node, the number of nodes from the root to the current node or whatever. So, so you may have this information stored in there and there's a difference between states and nodes. So some states may appear multiple times in the tree. Uh, so you might have two different nodes that correspond to the same state or you may have states that aren't in the tree yet because they haven't yet been generated. And if we look at this in terms of data structures, ADTs, these are the methods that we need. We need to be able to make a queue with certain items, usually they're just the start state. We need to check whether the queue is empty we need to add new items to the queue and then we need to take off the, the next item from the queue. Now we're going to compare these search strategies along these metrics. So first of all, and this will become clearer when we look at examples, so completeness doesn't necessarily find a solution if one exists. The time complexity, how long does it take to find a solution, the space complexity, how much memory does it use, and optimality. Does it always find the shortest path to the goal? So there's many, if you look online, you can see many strategies for solving Rubik's Cube, but usually those methods, don't, you know, th those methods always work, but they usually don't find the shortest path to the goal, you know, but they find some path to the goal. And we're going to define these things in terms of the following. So B is called the maximum branching factor of the search tree. So for the 8 puzzle, B was 4. For Rubik's Cube, it was either 6, 12, or 18, depending on how you look at things. So that's going to be a factor in determining the time and space complexity. We're going to use D to mean the depth of the least cost solution. So in our Romania problem, what's D equal to? What's the shortest? Three, that's right. If you go from Arad to Sibiu to Fagaras to Bucharest, you get to the goal in three steps. So D would be equal to three here. 
and m is the maximum depth of the state space. So that's usually the number of cities in the graph, or in some cases it may be infinity depending on the, the problem. The two by two Rubik's cube, m is about three million, I think. Yeah. The difference between d and m can be huge. So for the Rubik's cube, I think it can all always be solved in a maximum of 17 moves, something like that. So D would be, for this puzzle, D would actually be 17, but M is yeah, <laughs> several trillion. I don't know the exact number. Now, there's this whole uh, kind of theory about how you compare algorithms and measure how fast they are. We're not going to go into too much detail about this, but you can either attack this empirically or theoretically so you can implement the two algorithms and and run them on some data and test how long they take or you can try to analyze them mathematically now if you do benchmarking there are various issues that arise so you run the two algorithms on a computer and measure the speed so the speed may depend on many factors. You know, how is the algorithm implemented? What language is it written in? What compiler is used? What computer? So we try to keep those two things as similar as possible. We try to run the two algorithms on the same computer with the same compiler and implement them as similarly as possible. Excuse me, in order to take away any of those biases. And then you can test on multiple different starting points and then do statistical analysis and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so there's this whole kind of uh, apparatus that goes around that. But often we can analyze things theoretically. Now this, I mean, we're going to only use what we need basically for our purposes. Uh, most of the algorithms we're going to be looking at are sort of cubic or quadratic or exponential, sometimes logarithmic. But there's this whole mathematical theory behind this. So we say that uh, the running time of an algorithm on input of size n is order f of n means that for sufficiently, there exist numbers n0 and k such that when n is larger than n0, t of n is less than or equal to k times f of n. So for sufficiently large n, the running time is less than a constant times this function of n. So this is kind of a convenient way of comparing algorithms. If you've got one algorithm which, whose running time is order of n and another algorithm that's order of n squared, eventually for n large enough, the order n algorithm is going to be faster than the order n squared algorithm. For small n, it may be the other way around, but for large n, the ON, ON algorithm is faster. And so this is a good compromise between precision and ease of analysis. Okay, so if you're not familiar with this, you may want to go and do some reading of your own about this, but you, I think when we see it in some practical situations, you'll have a better understanding of it. Now, the search algorithms are going to be divided into two classes. So this week we're going to talk about uninformed search algorithms. Next week we'll talk about informed. Now, the difference is that with informed search algorithms, you have some way of estimating whether you're getting close to the goal or not. With these uninformed ones, you, you, you only know whether you've reached, when you reach the goal, you're told that you reached the goal, but before that you have no idea whether you're close to the goal or far away. And these are the algorithms we're going to look at, breadth-first search, uniform cost search, depth-first, depth-limited search, and iterative deep 